Well, now that the second exam is over, we are entering the home stretch of the course. Uh, and because of the way things have been laid out this semester, uh, July is going to be spent basically exploring expansions of our idea of the simplex method. So we've spent all this time studying what, what we've just been calling the simplex method, which is something involving a dictionary. Uh, and we're going to spend some time now uh, maybe exploring other ways to interpret it and also specializations of it for particular classes of applications. And we'll start by talking today about the revised simplex method. Actually, let me revise that. We're actually going to talk about the regular simplex method for the vast majority of this lecture. I've got something like 100 slides to go through, and I will talk about the revised simplex method somewhere around slide 90 or 92. Uh, it turns out that the revised simplex method is actually a relatively small elaboration on the what we the, the classic vanilla simplex method. Uh, but to get to it, to be able to talk about the revision that makes it the revised simplex method, we have to have a formulation of the simplex method in entirely linear algebraic terms. So the version of the simplex method we've been working with so far is this dictionary-based algorithm. And the description that we've given of how it works is an algorithmic description. You have a dictionary you perform some operation, you end up at another dictionary. And you keep doing that iteratively until you end up at some optimal solution or other terminal situation, so unbounded, or you determine the problem is infeasible. Uh, what we've maybe noticed over the semester is that there are a lot of eerie similarities, if not more, there are eerie similarities between the operations we're doing on a dictionary and the kinds of things we might do in a linear, linear algebra course, and the operations we might do as part of, for example, Gaussian elimination. And it turns out, I've been hinting at this all semester, maybe you figured it out already, it turns out that deep down, the simplex method is a bunch of linear algebra. And so we're going to spend this lecture uh, basically deconstructing constructing what we know about the simplex method with this dictionary form, and then building it back up from scratch using linear algebraic notation. Once we have that, we'll be able to talk pretty easily, in fact, about this uh, apparent revised simplex method. And of course, as is usually the case in these lectures, uh, not only will we have lots of fun uh, working with dictionaries and tedious algebra, we'll also have lots of fun trying to wrangle notation. I think this is the last big, uh, this lecture is the last big notation squeeze that we have to deal with. And there's going to be, I am going to, in fact, uh, commit a cardinal sin by my own logic, uh, given how much I've complained about sudden no changes of notation in the past. Uh, well, the chickens have come home to roost. Today, I'm going to, midway through this lecture, I'm going to arbitrarily and suddenly change my entire system of notation to try and make, uh, I guess, the rest of the derivation look a little bit more pleasant. So first, uh, we're already aware that we can write out an LP. This is from, you know, lectures two and three. We already know that we can write out an LP using this linear algebraic notation. We've been doing this all semester uh, because it's convenient, because if we're talking about an LP conceptually, it's nice to not have to write out the whole table of coefficients, especially if we're writing it out symbolically. So writing out an LP in terms of uh, actual coefficients, like four and one or negative one and two, uh, that's one thing. Having to write it out in terms of, uh, you know, the value a, uh, 1, 1, and A, 1, 2, that becomes pretty unreadable pretty quickly. If instead we represent our standard form linear program in this notation, it's sort of convenient. So we already know that there is some uh, parallel between a standard form LP and linear algebraic notation. The question is, is that just a notational similarity? Uh, and maybe we, we've seen enough now to know that it seems as if there's a lot more going on behind the scenes where linear algebra could be relevant. What I want to do uh, for part one of this, essentially, is I want to take apart the dictionary-based simplex method and put it back together in linear algebraic terms. Before I do that, uh, I want to basically do some experiments. I want to look at what we know about the dictionary-based method and see if we can find a way of fitting that into some linear algebraic mold. The experiments I'm going to do um, aren't going to directly feed into this derivation of this simplex method, the linear algebraic simplex method, but hopefully they will inform better what I'm doing during that derivation later. So uh, we can also obviously just expand out that linear algebraic representation to write this. That is, I can actually explicitly write all of the matrices and vectors. And I end up with this representation here, which, I don't know, your mileage may vary whether that's actually easier to read than what I have over here. Uh, 
Uh, and what I want to do is show that not only can I do that with the LP, but I can actually do that with the dictionary. So here's a dictionary. Um, this is the initial dictionary uh, from the LP on the previous slide. Here's a dictionary, and I want to demonstrate that if I wanted to do so, just like I can convert this, I guess, table of numbers into some matrices and vectors, I could convert the dictionary into that. So for this particular dictionary, the initial dictionary for this LP, um, of course, we've got our Slack variables over here on the left-hand side. Um, we could even package them all together into their own vector and call that w. Just like how up here we've got our um, objective coefficients, our objective expansion, which goes with this. I mean, because it's the initial dictionary, it is just a translation of this expression here. And we can observe that we can split it up to be a dot product, to be a, a dot product of some constant vector, which is our objective vector c, and um, this vector of our optimization variables, which, which we could call x. Uh, additionally, um, if I consider what I had on the previous slide versus this one, again, if I take a look at what's actually in the dictionary, I might observe that, in fact, the, if I break it up the way I have, so uh, in particular, I turn that constant column into a vector, and uh, I do a sign change here, so I use a, a subtraction operator. Uh, and this is the reason I'm using subtraction and not addition here is if you recall how we turned our standard form LP into a dictionary, we did it by rearranging stuff. And essentially, um, we took a constraint uh, of the form Let's just clean this up. We took a constraint that looks sort of like this, and we moved all of these terms over to the right-hand side and subtracted them off of the constant. So keeping that in mind, I guess it's reasonable that I want to subtract off the, um, the contents of each constraint, the linear combination of optimization variables from the constant column. And so I end up with this. And it turns out that this is that vector b from before. This is that vector w that I just constructed uh, for this dictionary form. And this is the matrix A. Uh, and then over here is, again, our vector x. Um, I should add that I've written this version of the vector x in vector notation. It's not, it's not meant to be a row vector. It's meant to just be a vector in a, it, it, taken as itself, not as a, a n by 1 or 1 by n matrix. Um, so I can do this. I can write the whole dictionary out in linear algebraic terms. Uh, and there isn't really any magic happening here. I could do this with lots of tables of numbers. I could find some way of turning the table of numbers into a matrix or a bunch of matrices. This in and of itself isn't very interesting. The interesting part, I think, is the fact that I was able to find a way of turning my dictionary into a linear algebraic um, a decomposition that used the exact same matrices and vectors that were on the previous slide in that standard form representation. I think that that is significant. Uh, and in fact, I could now write my dictionary out in, short, in shorthand with these linear algebraic expressions. So I'm going to avoid, uh, because we're now going to begin talking a lot about matrix multiplication and things, uh, I am going to slowly, over the course of this lecture, stop using the dot product notation, which I still like. I think it's a great notation. Um, I'm going to try and transition towards writing everything as a matrix uh, product. So that would be uh, C transpose X, if we treat both C and X as column vectors. Um, and the reason is because if I'm doing other matrix multiplications, uh, I don't want the dot product sort of grinding things to a halt if I end up with the dot product tangled up in other multiplications. If I'm doing C transpose X, then that's just a regular matrix multiplication, and so it's no big deal. Uh, and so uh, I can write my dictionary, this initial dictionary at least, like this. I've got zeta equals C transpose X, W equals uh, my vector B minus A times X. OK, great, but maybe that's just a coincidence. Uh, obviously, the shape of the initial dictionary isn't really what we're interested in if we're running the simplex algorithm. It's this uh, iterative process of choosing, entering, and leaving variables and performing pivots. Um, so what I want to do to try and expose some of the underlying linear algebra here is this experiment. It's a contrived experiment. Um, I want to do this. So I have a representation of my initial dictionary in terms of uh, zeta, the objective value, and w, this vector full of slack variables. What I'm wondering is, given that w, all the slack variables are, are bound together in this vector, and that all of the optimization variables are bound together in this one, I don't yet want to think about the situation where only, let's say, you know, x1 becomes basic, and w2 and w3 aren't. Because the way I've packaged these two things together makes it sort of hard to conceptualize. We will see later that that's actually pretty easy to do this. Um, what I want to do as my first experiment is consider what would happen 
if I perform a sequence of pivots that swaps the basic and non-basic variables. And we can maybe agree that in this LP, that is probably possible. I could pivot x1, w1, x2, w2, x3, w3, and I end up with a basis of just the x's, and the non-basic variables would be the w's. So that's my experiment. I want to see if I can do that using only linear algebra. So I don't want to actually perform the iterative pivoting on this dictionary. I instead want to find some symbolic way, some algebraic way of representing that, that, that full pivot, that full swap of non-basic and basic variables. Uh, and it turns out that I actually can make quite a bit of headway here. So the dictionary that I start with in an algebraic representation is this thing. And what I ultimately want is a diction what I would normally get if I had a dictionary where x was the basis, which is I want zeta to be some expansion of only the w's. So I only want something, you know, um, I don't want to call it c1. We'll call it um, q1 w1 plus q2 w2 plus q3 w3. I, I want an expression of my objective function in terms of only the non-basic variables w. I want x to be my basis, so x1, x2, x3. And additionally, I want whatever is over here, the um, expression on the right-hand side, just like in dictionary representation, I want to make sure it only involves the w's. So I want w to be non-basic and x to be basic. Um, we also know, of course, I just keep saying this in this course, that obviously when I do these pivots, I'm not changing anything about this system of equations. I'm just rearranging them. It's the same system of equations, just, just uh, phrased differently. And the reason why that's a really important thing to bring back up now is that what that really means is if I want this representation, if I want x to be my basis, really what I'm doing is just solving this stuff in terms of x, essentially. I, I can just do regular algebra to get the format that I want. The format that I want would be x over here on the left-hand side of this thing. And also, I want x to be removed from all of this stuff. I want to do some substitution or something so that all of the stuff on the right hand side is expressed entirely in terms of w. So what I could try doing is just solving this thing up here in terms of my vector x. Um, okay, so we have this uh, expression in our um, in our uh, linear algebraic dictionary that w is equal to uh, the vector b minus a times x. Um, and so what I could do is I could just take that. So w equals, uh, uh, whoops, b minus ax, and I could just try and solve that for x. Um, and so I could say, well, let's see, what, what's the easiest way of handling this? I guess a times x equals b minus the vector w, all right? And then if I want to just uh, get x out of this, what I could do is I could say, well, you know, a times x equals this. Well, I want to get rid of the a, so I'll just multiply both sides of the expression by a inverse and I get something like this. Okay, so now I have an expression of just x um, equals this expression here. I'm able to find an expression for x in terms of everything else that I have, uh, my constraint matrix A and my vectors B and W. And now I think, well, what else do I need? It looks like this is actually sort of, uh, this expression here, I'll expand it all the way out like the slide does, um, A inverse B minus A inverse W, it looks like this would, would satisfy what I want down here, the expression of the basis part of my dictionary. It is an expression of my basic variables x in terms only of, I guess, constants and my slack variables, my non-basic variables, w. But I'm not done yet because I also need to find a way of expressing my objective function, so this part of the dictionary, in terms only of my non-basic variables. So I know that my objective function, of course, equals this thing. I mean, that was in the original LP. The problem is that wouldn't work in a dictionary if x was basic because I'm not allowed to have basic variables in the expansion of my objective function. But on the other hand, I do have a way of taking my basic variables x and writing them in terms of other stuff. So what I could do is I could just take this and sub it in where I have x. And so I end up, if I, if I actually run that all the way through, I end up with my objective row being this thing. All right, and notice that what I have here, if we stare at this a bit, this thing here is actually going to be a scalar a, a, a value because I've got a vector of constants, my vector b, a matrix uh, inverse, hmm, a matrix inverse of constants, and my vector c. And so if I do these, these three multiplications um, 
multiplying on one side by a vector on the other side by a vector transpose, I will in fact just get a single number. On the other hand, over here, it looks like I have my expansion of objective coefficients. And we understand as usual that if we were to set our non-basic variables to zero, if w equals zero, then the value of the objective function just equals whatever this ends up being. Okay, so maybe this derivation is actually on the right track. Maybe we have some way of using only linear algebraic notation to represent um, the, the different states that a dictionary can be in. But I, I would be remiss, because you know I always complain about this. Um, there's this... <sighs> If we assume that the matrix A is invertible, so of course, when you, whenever you're doing these derivations or proving a theorem or something, you see statements like this shake your faith in um, uh, mathematical rigor, I think, which is, oh, of course, if we assume that some magical property holds, imagine all the amazing things we can do. Okay, yes, I'm going to do that a couple of times today. I promise at the end, I will come back and explain why it is a reasonable assumption to make. That is to say, there are cases where the matrix A or whatever matrix I happen to be talking about isn't invertible, but it turns out that in those cases, the dictionary-based method would fail as well, because I'll be able to show that the dictionary-based simplex method ultimately relies on matrices being invertible, just like this will. So yes, I know it'll be a bit of a delayed payoff, and I really hate having to use the word, uh, but if we assume that the matrix A is invertible, we can make this derivation. Later, we'll see why that's reasonable, and yeah. <laughs> so, um... If I have this initial dictionary and I actually employ that transformation, so my initial dictionary was this, and we break it up into our vectors C and X and W and B and, and our matrix A, it turns out this matrix A actually is invertible. So as much as I hate making assumptions, uh, it turns out that that was a reasonable assumption here. And it happens that this is my inverse. All right. Um, and I, I mentioned it last week, and I'm going to talk about it at the end of this uh, odyssey, that uh, if we really know what's good for us, especially in a computational sense, we really should avoid ever actually computing matrix inverses. What we're doing here is a derivation, so having the matrix inverse around is no big deal. Um, and in this case, because I'm using exact rational arithmetic, it's not as bad as it would be numerically. Um, but obviously, uh, we should be aware, even if you don't have uh, previous numerical analysis expertise or anything, that in the back of your head, if you find yourself actually explicitly computing a matrix inverse, there probably is a better way. And I'll talk a bit about that at the end of this. So in this case, there is my uh, inverse of the constraint matrix A. If I now use the thing I just derived, so the value of x will be this thing. And so I'll just, I'll just run this all the way through. So in this case, I multiply A inverse by B, uh, and then I get this constant vector, because A inverse and B are just constants. Once you've provided me the LP, I have all that information. And then I've got this, because W, the non-basic variables, those are unknowns, and so I, I don't know what they're equal to, so I just leave it in symbolic form. And that's congruent to what I had earlier. So uh, in my initial dictionary, I had W, which was the basis then, expressed in terms of a constant vector minus some product of a matrix and my non-basic variables. Now, when I've decided that x is my basis, I sort of have the same thing. A constant vector minus a matrix times my non-basic variables. Now, what do I do about the objective row? So the objective row, again, was C transpose x. The problem is, if I've decided that x is my basis, then I need to get it out of the uh, objective row. So what I do is apply the same substitution. I know that x equals this thing. And so I just plug this in instead of x uh, in, in this expression. So instead of x, I plug in um, a inverse b minus a inverse w. OK, so I plug that in, and then, I, work, and then I, I basically just distribute, and I end up with this thing. And I can now numerically work that out. So uh, as I said earlier, this, this term here, ends up, if you notice, all, all three of the pieces of it, C transpose A inverse and B, those are just numbers. Those are just constants because I've been provided all that information at the beginning. Once I do that, I end up, um, these three things multiply together to give this scalar, 111 over 2. Uh, and then this thing here, C transpose A inverse W, uh, and if you think the notation is getting dense now, wait until you see what happens in about 10 or 20 slides. Um, this thing, C transpose A inverse W, ends up being this. Um, and if I actually perform as much of this multiplication as I can, so if I try and at least compute this product here, um, I end up with this thing. And if I expand that out in terms of W, I get this. And if you look at that, that looks a lot like 
a typical objective row in a dictionary. It's a constant at the beginning plus some linear combination of my uh, non-basic variables. Uh, obviously, I've put them in brackets, so I mean there's a sign change in there. Uh, and we'll see later that in fact that sign change is something we have to consider when we when we develop an algorithm around this. Like it'll, it'll change the way we select our entering variable. Like we'll look for a positive coefficient or a negative coefficient instead of a positive one. But otherwise, this looks pretty familiar. It looks a lot like the uh, objective row of a dictionary. And now, if I put everything together, I get this. Here was my initial dictionary, and then here is the rewritten dictionary with my basis being x instead of w. And yeah, obviously a lot of notation had to happen along the way, and I, I wouldn't blame you for staring at this and saying, it looks like we're doing a huge amount of work here. That is, if I could just do a bunch of pivots, it seems like that would be a lot easier than figuring out a inverse and then doing all these weird matrix multiplications. What's interesting to note is that, in fact, that actually is what you're doing if you run the dictionary-based method. If you run the dictionary-based method and do the pivots you would need to go from x1, x2, x3 being non-basic to x1, x2, x3 being basic, you are essentially performing all of these calculations, whether you know about it symbolically or not. So these are the two dictionaries in linear algebraic terms. Um, if I now take a look at, at what would happen if I uh, applied that pivoting to my dictionary form, my original dictionary, so if I didn't use linear algebra, I just did the pivots, this is the dictionary I would end up at. Um, so I, I pivot x1, w1, x2, w2, x3, w3, so I end up with x1, x2, x3 being the basis, w1, w2, w3 being non-basic. So if I pivot the old-fashioned way, the way that we've been doing all semester, if I now compare these two, I notice that they match. So my derivation was on the right track. Um, and really, not only was it uh, maybe a good idea to, to try and uh, break it down algebraically the way I did, but notice that uh, trying to solve the equations for x and then subbing that into the objective function did in fact give me exactly what I wanted. Um, my hope is that this experiment uh, allowed us to, to maybe see through some of the things we were already doing with dictionaries and realize that deep down we were sort of doing linear algebra all along. And the benefit of writing everything out symbolically like this is maybe it's easier to draw some conclusions about where the real work is being done and also to avoid a couple of maybe issues that we've noticed with dictionary form. So one of them is if I do it this way, if every time I need a new dictionary, I compute it from scratch using my original vectors A, B, and C, or matrix A and vectors B and C, then that means no matter how many dictionaries I go through, I'm, I'm not going to end up with uh, maybe accumulating rounding errors or something. If I use dictionary form and I keep doing pivots, the input that I use for dictionary I plus one is the output of dictionary I. And so if I pivot a huge number of times and I'm not using exact rational arithmetic, I could end up in trouble due to errors piling up, among other things. The other thing, obviously, I should observe is that, yeah, maybe this symbolically looks like a lot of work. If I have everything written out in symbolic linear algebraic notation, maybe I can uh, use that. I can dig into the vast wealth of different results on, for example, numerical linear algebra, which talk about fast ways of performing certain linear algebra operations. It's not as obvious in dictionary form when those are happening, but in symbolic form it is. Maybe I can find clever algorithms to compute products like this one or this thing or this thing um, that can save me some time. Um, now, this slide contains a strange statement, um, and I, I thought actually about deleting it before recording, uh, and I, I left it in, which is that if you think back to what you have to do, back when you had to do a lot of pivoting by hand, so back before midterm one, uh, when you were performing pivots by hand every now and then, um, maybe you noticed that fundamentally the process of performing a pivot seems a lot like some of the steps you'd perform in Gaussian elimination. It turns out that the steps you perform are in fact elementary row operations. Um, and therefore, and this is the provocative statement, therefore that a sequence of pivot operations is essentially a type of Gaussian elimination. That's quite a leap. I'm leaving that in because I think that this experiment does justify that. It's a bizarre thing to say, it's a provocative statement, but I think that the experiment does justify it. We notice that this sequence of pivots we performed to put x1, x2, x3 in the basis 
appeared to compute a matrix inverse. I mean, if I now pull out the coefficients from this, I have a matrix inverse. I've got the inverse of my original constraint matrix A. Um, now, of course, we still have to think about, well, what about all the steps in between? What if I only pivoted some of the Ws out of the basis? What would I end up with then? And it turns out that, in fact, that is sort of an intermediate step along the way to computing an inverse. So although it turns out, I mean, the, this, this, whether this is interpreted to be true literally or not is not relevant to our derivation, I really want to drive that point home, that all along what we've been doing with dictionaries is actually a set of operations that maybe all of us are pretty familiar with already that come from things like, um, so elementary row operations that we might have employed somewhere like Gaussian elimination. Um, so the point of the example, the reason I did the experiment, wasn't that this inherently gives us a linear algebraic simplex method, but I wanted to expose some of the really obvious places where um, you know, a common linear algebra operations, transformations like computing an inverse or matrix multiplication, are being performed. We can use this and maybe put ourselves in the right mindset using this to start from scratch and try and rebuild the entire simplex method sort of in symbolic linear algebraic terms. But first, um, we've got a big notation problem. And um, so I'm giving a warning now, and in a few slides, I'm going to have to do something that I do not, I am not going to be proud of. Um, basically, we have an issue, which is that we're going to need to manipulate our dictionary representation a little bit to accommodate this case where I want to do pivoting that's a bit less heavy-handed. So in my experiment, I pivoted from having um, this fact, having the W's over on the left to having the W's be non-basic. So I, I swapped the entire basis with the non-basic variables. But that's not realistic. Obviously, in practice, I might want to just pivot one thing at a time. And my optimal solution will probably have some combination of, of slack variables and optimization variables in the basis. How do I represent that? Um, it turns out that I need to, to modify a little bit the format of my problem. So my the dictionary notation we've been using, although it's compatible with linear algebra, doesn't give us enough freedom. So I'm going to define a new, um, essentially a rearrangement of the traditional dictionary, and that's going to require me to define a bunch of new notation. And the way I'm going to do that is, in fact, by deprecating a bunch of notation we're already using and then using the simple names like A and C to refer to something different. Um, so bear with me. So here's my LP and standard form, the same one as earlier. I'm going to define something called equational form. Uh, and uh, maybe you, you could, if you stare at this for a little while, you might realize that equational form is the same as the regular dictionary representation. I've just moved stuff to a different side of the equal sign. So when we define dictionaries way back in May, when we initially defined a dictionary, um, we noted that by using slack variables instead of constraints, we could get rid of all of these less than or equal to signs because the slack variable sort of absorbs all the slack in that inequality. That means the only constraints we have to care about are non-negativity constraints. Once we have slack variables in dictionary form, the only thing we care about is keeping every variable from going negative. I want to do that here too. I just want to make sure that the slack variables aren't treated as being special. That's the issue. Um, I need to get to a place where there are just variables. There's no real difference between the W's and the X's. And so I'm going to define something called equational form. And I'm going to define slack variables just like I do in a dictionary, but I'm going to label them as X variables. I'm not going to call them W. And I'm going to treat them not much differently than I would treat my optimization variables. So we'll call this representation equational form. And um, notice that what I've done here is I've just taken each constraint and I've added it, I've given each constraint its own slack variable. But unlike in dictionary form, where what I would write would be something more along the lines of for x4, for example, x4 in a dictionary, if I use x4 as a slack variable, be 1 minus 4x1 plus x2 minus 2x3. So that's how I would write that in a dictionary. In equational form, I put all of the variables, slack and otherwise, um, on the same side of the uh, equal sign. Actually, maybe, no, I'll do it this way. Um, and then I put the constant on the other side. That's all I'm doing. And in fact, the constant, we put it over on the, um, 
over on the right. So that's it. It's really just a rearrangement of the dictionaries that we're used to, but with all of the variables on the same side of the equal sign. And uh, going forward, we're not going to care for a particular variable, whether it was initially a slack variable or an optimization variable. All variables are variables. Uh, and so I put everything on one side of the equal sign. I put my constant bound on the other. The reason why that's convenient, if we notice what we had to do to get dictionary representation into linear algebraic form, it was a bit clunky that we have this constant column sitting over here with this product involving variables. Equational form sort of gets rid of that. Um, additionally, in equational form, slack variables are not called w, they're numbered as x's. And that means when I'm done, if I have an LP that had originally n optimization variables and m constraints, the number of variables I end up with in equational form would be n plus m. I give every constraint its own slack variable. But just like in dictionary form, once I'm done with this transformation, I, I have all these equalities because the slack variable soaks up all the slack in the inequality. And the only constraints I, I have to actually consider from now on are non-negativity constraints, just like before. All variables have to be non-negative. However, if I do this, we might notice if I use this equational form, um, then wait, I've got these extra variables. All variables are variables, right? Which means I guess all variables have to be treated equally in the objective function too. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to modify my representation once I've added the slack variables to extend my objective function for every single variable that I have. And it'll be easy. I just define a zero coefficient for all the slack variables. So uh, as a result, what I end up with, if we consider what I have here, is an objective expression with n plus m variables. And if I were to pull out the coefficients of all of these um, linear combinations below, I would end up with, an uh, let's see, m rows and n plus m columns, uh, a matrix of coefficients. And so I can write this as, we'll call this equational form. And now we have a problem, which is that I'm used to calling the matrix of coefficients A, and I'm used to calling the objective vector C. But if you gave me an LP like this one, you would consider that C would be the vector 3, 6, 2, right? But yet I'm telling you C is the vector, let's see, it would be 3, 6, 2, 0, 0, 0. Clearly, those are not the same vector. For the sake of this lecture, um, my choices were as follows. One, I could say, look, yeah, I gave you the vector C is 3, 6, 2. And then I'm gonna, I have to call this C prime or uh, C hat or C bar. Yeah. Uh, because of all the notation we're going to need in this lecture, I have made the decision to do the following. You give me an LP, and we're going to call the original specification, let's say, C tilde. So, so C with a stylish haircut. And then, uh, for the sake of actually getting the work done, we're going to define this new augmented objective vector to just be the original C. Same thing with my matrix A. So this is the cardinal sin I talked about. For the sake of this lecture, I'm going to assume if you give me an LP in standard form, whoops, that should be a less than or equal to sign. If you give me an LP in standard form, we will call the variables that you use uh, C tilde or A tilde, B tilde, and, and C tilde. It turns out that B is actually the same in both places, so we don't need to rename it. And that way, when I convert to equational form, I can now use just the regular names A, B, and C. So I know, yes, that's a weird thing to do. Trust me, you don't want to see, given all of the, the symbolic stuff we're going to have to work with, um, getting rid of those tildes will sort of be helpful. So for the sake of this lecture, uh, when I talk about A and C, I'm talking about the equational form of the LP, not standard form. And we can obtain the equational form pretty easily from standard form, though. So if you give me an LP in standard form, again, that should be a less than or equal to sign. Um, if you give me an LP in standard form, all I do to put it into equational form is I take the constraint matrix and I put it right here. And to construct the matrix A, I just, I just fold in an identity matrix. Um, and if you, if you stare at this, that's what this really is. This is an, an identity matrix. The identity matrix represents the slack variables. Uh, and then similarly, I take the objective vector that came in, I make that occupy the first few positions of my new objective vector, and then I add a zero coefficient to the objective vector for all of my new variables. So I'm really just augmenting my matrix A and my vector C to fold in all of these slack variables that I'm creating for each constraint. And for the sake of this lecture, we're going to call the resulting matrix A and the resulting vector C. And we'll assume, for the sake of having a name for what came in, the, the standard form representation, we'll call them A tilde and C tilde.
uh, maybe it was obvious that um, in my original set of um, optimization variables, so the x in my standard form would be just the, the variables x1, x2, up to xn as usual. The x that I'm using in equational form is extended to include all those slack variables. So it, it contains x1 up to xn, but it also contains all of these things, these new variables I've added that are the slack variables. Now, the advantage of this is, although that's a, that's a bit of a jarring transformation to make, I mean, the notation especially, once I'm done, I really do have the sort of equality of variables that I wanted. All variables are variables. Once I'm done and I have my equational form, it doesn't really matter to me what the slack variables were originally. It's true that if I were to solve the LP and I get an optimal solution, I will care that, you know, these are the variables that I care about for the optimal assignment. But when I'm working with it, once I'm in equational form, I just have a bunch of variables and all variables are variables. They all get treated the same way. And like a dictionary, equational form doesn't actually have any constraints, I guess, besides equalities. It only, the only inequalities that I have to worry about are these non-negativity constraints. And there's just this one set of them. All variables are variables, and I want all variables to be non-negative. So what do I want to do? I would like to find a way of starting here, and hopefully you can take my word for it, that using equational form instead of my traditional dictionary will make it a little bit easier to manage this. But hopefully you at least agree that equational form and the old dictionary representation are essentially the same. They're just rearrangements, convenient rearrangements. Starting from this, I would like to find a way of writing out the simplex method entirely in terms of linear algebra. So I, I want to change it from an algorithm that works with this sort of nebulous table of numbers to be an algorithm that works in terms of common linear algebraic operations like matrix multiplication and I guess if I have to, computing an inverse or solving a system of equations. So what do I have to do? Well, first, I need to keep track of which variables are basic and which variables are non-basic. Once I know that, I would like to know, here's my basis, could you tell me the value of each basic variable? And we know that in the dictionary form, that's really easy. If I have a dictionary, then the value of each basic variable, I just pull it right out of that constant column. But with the linear algebraic representation, it turns out that's a little bit more difficult. Um, then, if I have a particular, if I'm at a particular step with a particular basis, I, I guess I want to check whether it's optimal or not. And then, if it isn't, I want to choose entering and leaving variables. And then finally, I need some way of actually performing a pivot. Now, we'll see later that it turns out that the actual pivot seems quite a bit less labor intensive linear algebraically because a lot of the work has been moved to the other steps. In the dictionary based method, getting the values of basic variables is easy because the pivot operation involves so much work. Depending on how we model it in the linear algebraic representation, the pivot operation could be almost trivial. It could be changing a set of indices and then just that's it. Whereas actually computing the value of basic variables, that could require some more work. So here is a matrix in equational form. Uh, or, or a matrix and a, a vector of variables in equational form. And our first question is, how do we keep track of the basis? And I'm going to talk about this in two different ways. So now I'm going to talk about it in terms of what does it mean to have both basic and non-basic variables. Later, we'll talk about it in more concrete implementation-based terms, like how do we store our, our collection of basic variables. So here is my product A times X, and it's this matrix times this vector. Suppose that I decide, notice that because there are m, uh, the number of rows m in the matrix is 4, that would imply that my basis should have size 4. Um, so suppose I decide that these four variables are my basic variables. So that would be x2, x4, x5, x7. Uh, okay, so uh, I could always, you know, without loss of generality, in fact, I could sort of say, well, look, symbolically, assume that the basic variables are always the first four things, the first four columns of the matrix. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take one step in between and say, so suppose you give me um, this matrix vector product and you tell me that these are the four basic variables. If I actually compute the product, the product itself doesn't change if I permute both the entries of this vector and the columns of this matrix. And you can, if you work out on paper a quick example of, I don't know, like a, um, a two by four matrix and a four element vector, you might be able to agree with this. It turns out if I uh, rearrange the matrix and the vector with the same permutation, I don't change the product at all. So for example, what I could choose to do is if you tell me that these are the four basic variables, I could make them, I could rearrange the vector to put those four 
variables first, and I could rearrange the matrix to put those four columns first, and the product will be the same. Um, now, obviously, if we're thinking about implementation, we might think this seems a little bit labor intensive. Is there a way around this? And the answer, it turns out, is yes. They're actually, I don't need to actually physically rearrange the matrix. I just have to keep that in mind. I have to sort of visualize the matrix at any given step as having the basic columns and the non-basic columns separate. Um, so what I could do, again, this is, we can do this literally for our derivation, but it's fine to just do it um, uh, conceptually when we implement it. We don't actually have to physically rearrange columns of the matrix, just keep track of the permutation we're working with. We could adopt the convention, um, and this is going to apply to the matrix and to the vector of variables, and in fact to all of the other vectors we work with. We could adopt the convention that if you tell me that you have a particular basis, so if you say the basis today is equal to x2, x4, x5, and x7, because we know that as long as the rearrangement is done consistently, we can perform the rearrangement without changing anything about the result, we could always assume that this matrix product AX, given a particular choice of basis, can be uh, decomposed into two pieces, two uh, sub-matrices AB and AN. And similarly, the uh, vector of optimization variables can be decomposed into XB and XN. So, so two sort of sub-vectors that are the basic variables and non-basic variables. And AB would be the set of columns corresponding to basic variables. Uh, AN would be the set of columns corresponding to non-basic variables. And it turns out that due to the way that block decompositions work, that means that this product works out perfectly. So um, that is to say, I can actually write it symbolically as this, and the product works out sort of the way we expect it to. So A times X, if you give me a particular choice of basis, will be a combination of a bunch of columns, the matrix AB, followed by a bunch of columns, which will be the matrix AN, and then the product would be uh, multiplied by XB, XN. And it turns out if I actually do that, so again, because of the way block matrices work, the product ends up being this thing. So if you give me a basis and I decompose both the matrix and the vector into pieces, the basic and non-basic pieces, this product AX will be exactly equal to this sum here. The product of the uh, basic matrix that AB and the basic variables XB plus the uh, non-basic matrix AN and the non-basic variables XN. Now, in practice, as I alluded to a minute ago, we don't actually have to physically rearrange A to do this. If I tell you that the basis consists of certain variables, and I say, give me the matrix AB, or the vector XB, well, to get the vector XB, you make me a vector of all the basic variables. That's it. You just run through and grab them. And to make the matrix AB, you go find the columns that correspond to those variables. So there's X2, there's X4, there's X5, and there's X7. And you just pull those columns in one by one into, oops, into AB. Uh, that's it. You don't actually have to, to physically rearrange A every time. As long as you keep track of what your basis is, you could always go and extract the matrix AB or the matrix AN, and similarly for XB and XN. In a minute, I'm also going to talk about the vector CB and CN, which would be the, the parts of the objective vector corresponding to basic and non-basic variables. And hopefully, um, this transformation becomes somewhat natural. In practice, we typically don't rearrange the columns of A. We just keep track of a permutation. We keep track of what our basis is. Uh, okay, so then the question is, if you give me a particular basis, so you've already given it to me, I've already figured out the values of A, B, X, B, A, N, and X, N. So if we ignore it for now how we keep track of that computationally, if you give me a particular basis and you form this decomposition, the question then is, uh, I guess we've already answered point one in our grand plan, how to represent the basis versus non-basic variables. The next question is, how do we find the value of particular variables? That's what this question is asking. How do I get the assignment of values to my variables xi? And this is still the simplex method. So there are certain things we can assume. One of them is, at any step of the simplex method, all of my non-basic variables will equal zero. So half of the question is already answered. How do I get the values of my basic variables? Okay, well, let's take a look. So I have my equational form, AX equals B. And I know that for a particular choice of basis, I can decompose that into ABXB plus ANXN. And of course, if I just combine these two lines, then I get this. So ABXB plus ANXN equals B. Um, and then uh, if I stare at this for a minute, I could say, well, suppose that I care about the values of my basic variables. So I'll just copy this out. So ABXB uh, plus AN 
xn. So I'm not, I guess I have to give x a hat here because it's a vector. That equals b. And I think I just want to know the value of xb here. Uh, whoops, this is a, this should be xn. Okay, so I, I'll do some rearrangement and just try and, and, and try and solve this for xb. So that would be b minus an uh, xn. All right, and then I have to somehow get rid of this, this multiplication by ab. All right, so we do this. We'll just say, well, just multiply both sides by ab inverse, and I get this. And it will actually turn out later to be quite helpful to have fully fact, uh, distributed this, so I'm going to do that. So that's minus uh, ab uh, inverse an xn. Okay, so that's an expression for the value of my set of non-basic variables xb. Uh, additionally, if I say, now, could you please give me, I've given you a choice of basis, I've produced this decomposition, could you actually tell me the values of each variable xb? I don't just want an equation, give me their values. At any particular iteration, with respect to any particular basis, we understand that in the simplex algorithm, the non-basic variables are all zero, which means that if I want to know the value of xb, this entire term is just zero because I'm multiplying it by a zero vector. That means if I assume my non-basic variables equal zero, the values of my basic variables will be this thing. So you go grab all the columns corresponding to basic variables, take the inverse, and then multiply that by my vector b. Okay, and then of course I've got to do this. Ah, we've got that word again. Um, so I'll talk about that later. It turns out that we can reasonably assume that this matrix a, b is invertible. Uh, and I, I want to wait until the end to do that because I think by the end we'll understand a bit better what a, b is supposed to represent. So just like before, we also have this problem that I can get the values of my basic variables, but I also need to find some way of writing out my objective function strictly in terms of my non-basic variables. So if I do the same thing I did before, which is I have my objective vector and I split it up into pieces. So my objective function is C transpose X. It's the dot product of C and X. Uh, what I need to do though is keep track of where are my basic variables, where are my non-basic ones. So I'm gonna split this up into two pieces. Um, the dot product of of c and x, it can be factored out into, be, into two smaller dot products of the basic uh, variables xb multiplied by whatever entries of c go with those, plus the dot product of the non-basic, whoops, the non-basic variables xn and the coefficients that would go with those. So all I've done is I've just broken this up into pieces just like I was doing with a and um, x before. I've factored c, or I've, I shouldn't say factor, I've converted c into two subvectors, one of the coefficients for the basic variables, one for the coefficients of the non-basic ones. Uh, and now I think, well, okay, so I, I want the expansion of the objective function. And that, of course, um, by the logic from our experiment from earlier and the logic is, that was on the previous slide, um, I need some way of getting rid of my xb. So this is the objective function itself, but if I consider the way I do the simplex method where I express at each step the objective function strictly in terms of the non-basic variables, I have to find some way of eliminating this. I don't want the basic variables in my expansion. On the other hand, based on what we had in the previous slide, so on the previous slide we derived that x sub b is equal to this expression. So it's this. And so what I could do is I could just take that and I could sub that in. So here's xb and I just replace it with this whole thing and that's where I get this. And then I do some, some rather hideous algebra and I end up here. Uh, and so what I've done is I've subbed in an expression for xb that doesn't contain xb itself. That way, the expression I end up with for my objective uh, function doesn't involve my basic variables. It involves a whole bunch of stuff that depends on my basic variables, but it doesn't involve the basic variables themselves. It doesn't involve xb. Um, if we stare at this for a minute and try and equate it to what, we, what we're used to in a dictionary for my objective value, we'll notice we have the following. Um, so I think the next slide actually does this too. But notice that these two terms together, each of these two terms involves my non-basic variables, x, n. Okay, and we know in our objective function, we're used to seeing an objective function that looks like, um, so there's my attempt at a zeta for today. My objective function might be five minus four um, x, let's say that x3 is non-basic, plus two x, uh, let's, let's say x5 uh, minus x6. So what we expect our objective function to look like, I don't want to use 5 actually, it looks too much like my zeta. Um, 
my objective function should be a constant minus some linear combination of non-basic variables that we, because they're all set to zero, has no impact on the objective value at that point. Um, but I do need, even though these are all going to be zero, I still need to know these coefficients because they're going to help me choose my entering variable later. The expression I've just come up with, uh, an expression of the objective value in terms of a particular set of basic and non-basic variables, this expression it looks to me as if, given that these terms here both involve xn, this corresponds to this part of my objective expansion, the part uh, that involves the linear combination of non-basic variables. And sort of by default, that means the only term that's left over, which is this thing, has to be that constant at the beginning. And if we stare at it, we can conclude that yes, indeed, that does look like a constant. I don't see any x's in that expression. C, B, transpose, A, B, inverse, and B are all constants. It's true that they depend on my choice of basis, but they don't, they don't involve my variables x, B, or x, N. So this is a constant. And it turns out that indeed, yes, this is the objective value for that particular choice of basis. Um, and under the usual assumption that at that choice of basis, my non-basic variables equal zero. So that would be the case x, n equals zero. Uh, it's worth pausing and, and meditating a bit on this. So at each step, as I pivot through my different choices of basis, it turns out that the objective value is equal to this thing. And all along, we've, we've sort of had in the back of our minds that certainly the, the objective value is a function of a little bit more than just this vector c. But having finally this expression written out in front of us reinforces a lot of things that we've, we've been hinting at all semester. So for example, um, we've known all semester that certainly the constraints and the bounds on the constraints contribute in a lot of ways to the optimal objective value. Because clearly, if I just gave you a linear function and said, what's its maximum with no constraints, in most cases, unless the function is constant, the maximum is going to be unbounded. Um, because we can, or, or, and I can make it as big or as small as I want. So having the constraints involved clearly has some impact on the objective, on the optimal objective value. Having this expression actually in front of us, I think is, pre make, is pretty beautiful. There, there's some elegance to this. It shows us how, for a given choice of basis, the objective value is, in a sense, equally determined by my objective coefficients, the coefficients in my constraints, and the bounds on my constraints. They're all working together to produce my objective value. Uh, and additionally, it is a sort of interesting reinforcement of duality because, okay, right there in the middle, there is my vector, there, there is this matrix uh, inverse, but it, it's a matrix derived from the, the uh, coefficients of my constraints. On one side, I have uh, coefficients from my original primal objective function. On the other side, I have what really amount to coefficients in my dual objective function, all of them working together to produce the ultimate objective value. And the sort of mirror image I can see with primal on the left and dual on the right sort of makes a lot of sense now that I know about duality because I understand that ultimately the optimal solution of both the uh, primal and dual programs will be the same if both are feasible and bounded. Uh, and so that's one illustration of how duality creeps in even if we're talking, even if we hadn't heard about duality yet, this expression is here and this is the way the objective function is defined at each step. Um, okay, so the next thing though is uh, we can get the values of non-basic variables. We can even use this, this property we just derived, so that would be this big expression here, is my entire objective row. This would be the, the, the row of the dictionary that gives my objective expansion. So the next step is how would I be able to choose a pivot? So I want to choose an entering variable, for example. And we know that we choose our entering variable by looking inside of our objective row um, for uh, variables with particular properties, so particular coefficients. So in the dictionary form, that would be positive coefficients. So I know that my objective row, this expression here, should be what I'm looking at if I care about choosing an entering variable. So what should I do? Uh, what I need is some way of, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, visualizing the objective function in the same terms I would for a dictionary. In other words, in a dictionary, I, I like to think of the objective row as looking like this. It has a constant at the beginning, that's the objective value, and then a linear combination of uh, non-basic variables, well, uh, basic variables with zero coefficients, I guess, non-basic variables with coefficients that could be zero but may not be, um, 
and then use that to choose my entering variable. So what I want then is to get that set of coefficients. What are the objective coefficients with respect to a particular basis? Um, and I'm gonna call that Z. The set of objective coefficients is Z. That was a deliberate choice of notation. If you think back to duality, we remember that we often call the dual slack variable Z. And we know that connection between the, uh, dual, the values of each dual slack variable Z and the objective coefficients in the primal problem. That's why I'm using the name Z here. It's because of that significance to duality. Uh, and we also know that uh, if we express our dictionary purely in these terms, the only coefficients that I expect to be non-zero in Z are going to be the non-basic variables. Of course, non-basic variables can have zero coefficients too, but I should never see a basic variable with a non-zero coefficient in the objective row of my dictionary. So because the distinction between basic and non-basic is still significant, I'm going to do the same decomposition to Z as I did to X. So I've already done that to X. I've broken X up into XB and XN. For a given choice of basis, the basic x variables and the non-basic ones. I'm going to do the same thing to z. So I'm going to break up the dot product of z and x into zb, xb, and zn, xn. With the understanding, uh, this implicit understanding that as we're used to, the coefficients of basic variables in the objective function will always be zero. So what I want to do is figure out what are the, what basically, what is the value of this vector zn? We know that the value of xn is going to be zero, but we also know that uh, in our dictionary representation, even though the non-basic variables are zero, we still care about their objective coefficients because that's how we choose pivots. Um, okay, so what else do we need? Well, we already have this. It turns out that, you know, we, we on the previous slide, discussed this. At, uh, for a particular choice of basis, the actual objective value will be this thing. So I just need to find an expression for zn. And here we are, a nice wall of algebra to stare at. Um, and so the expansion of my objective function that we already derived starts from here and ends up with this expression here. And I guess I forgot to boldface x in here. Sorry about that. Um, and notice that in that derivation, we ended up with these extra terms involving um, xn. So we started with this. So that is just the objective coefficients for the non-basic variables themselves. But then when we tried to remove xb by doing a substitution, we introduced, well, both of these two terms, but certainly this sort of ugly looking term here. What I want is to have a form that looks like, um, that looks like this. A and also because zb equals zero, I don't really care uh, about this term here. So I wanna find basically some expression um, that looks like, um, if I doctor this up a bit, I basically want to find a way of writing the objective function that looks like this, zn transpose xn. So if I can find a way of factoring the objective function so that it's this thing minus just one thing times xn, that one thing will be the vector zn that I'm looking for. So that's the goal of this. So what I'm going to do is take the only other terms I have to work with and basically just factor them to pull xn out of it. Uh, and so I do that, and so this just comes right down. And then this gets factored. If I just factor out an xn, I end up with this thing, this really hideous looking thing, times xn. And I stare at that, and I realize that is the format that I'm looking for. It, this, uh, by process of elimination, it appears like this, this whole thing here ends up being zn transpose. So I have what I want. Okay, so that implies that Zn transpose equals this thing. And we stare at that and say, yeah, okay, great, but I'm not used to defining vectors in terms of their own transpose. Is there a way I can just write, you know, Zn equals something? Well, sure, I just take Zn transpose, I mean, obviously Zn uh, equals Zn transpose all transpose. So I'm gonna do that. So I have an expression that says Zn transpose equals this, which means Zn equals this all transposed. And if I do if I do my best to try and simplify that, I end up with Zn equals this thing. So that requires basically just folding the transpose into the expression on the inside, which isn't too exciting. Uh, and then trying to combine terms to the best of my ability. I end up with Zn, the objective coefficients of non-basic variables, is equal to this whole thing over here. All right. And I've now, uh, assuming we have, that you hand me a particular choice of basis, which is still a little bit up in the air, if you hand me a choice of basis, I now have enough to represent a sort of pseudo dictionary using only linear algebraic notation. So you hand me the matrices A, A and uh, just the matrix A and the vectors B and C, and you say, here are the variables that are basic today, Bill. Could you give me the dictionary that goes with this? 
I now have a fully linear algebraic expression for that dictionary. So here's the objective value. Here are the, the values of my basic variables. Here is uh, the system of equations uh, for my the, the set of basis rows for my dictionary. And then this ugly looking thing, this would be um, the set of objective coefficients. And I have everything I need here to run the simplex method. Of course, I have to now define what I do at each step, but we have everything we need, everything we're used to from our dictionary notation, we now have in linear algebraic notation. I'm going to talk about the derivation of the simplex method in part two. I have a couple more points to make about this uh, pseudo dictionary first. So one thing, a question we should get very used to asking ourselves now that we know about duality is, okay, here's the primal dictionary. What does the dual dictionary look like? And we sort of want it to look basically the same, but transposed. And it's not going to. It turns out if I take, if I try and derive the dual dictionary for this, it ends up looking quite a bit different. Um, and actually I should add, I mean, there are ways in which it sort of is the same thing transposed if you stare at it. Uh, I guess what I meant a minute ago was we expect it to look very notationally similar. We sort of expect the dual dictionary to also have a relatively simple term down here and a complicated one up here. But due to the way transposes work, we don't. We end up with a rather similar expression for the objective value, which shouldn't surprise us. We know how duality works, but our objective coefficients for um, the dual dictionary are simple and the expression of the values of the basic variables is hideously complicated. And in a sense, I mean, yes, we understand the negative transpose property. In a sense, this is sort of dissatisfying because we expect from dictionary representations, at least, that the primal and dual dictionaries are symmetric. That, I mean, besides negating them, that they look very similar. And yet for some reason, the expression of the dual dictionary is way different than the expression of the primal one. So why is that? I mean, besides the obvious that we, we computed one by transposing the other. Um, the reason is because uh, we derived our primal primal dictionary starting from a representation, the equational form of the primal LP. In other words, all the names we defined, like A, B, and C, and you know, arguably you know, C, B, and C, N, and X, B, and X, N, all of those names were defined using the natural language of the primal LP. Uh, and therefore, if we tried to compute the dual based on the natural terminology of the primal LP, we end up with something that looks a bit clunky. Um, and the one way I could contextualize that is by observing that if we go way, way back to our, I don't know if we can actually go that far back, um, if we were to look at the equational form for our primal LP, it would look something like this. Um, it would have a matrix that's sort of uh, it has m rows and n plus m columns, um, and then our vector b would have m entries. Uh, if I were to first construct the dual LP explicitly, so in standard form or something, and then I were to construct a um, uh, equational form for the dual LP, uh, then I would actually end up with a different equational form, obviously, because I would have this transposed problem. If I construct the dual from scratch, I would end up with a matrix that wasn't M by N plus M. I would end up with a matrix that's N by N plus M plus N. Uh, and as I, I'd end up with a lot more convenient notation in the dual in the representation of the dual dictionary. Of course, in exchange, if I were to take that and convert it back to the primal dictionary, I'd end up with a clunky notation as well. So although the difference in notation doesn't seem to add up because we expect symmetry, the reason is essentially because we started from this thing that was uh, couched in terms of the primal LP, gave everything a name, and then did a derivation based on that. So when it came time to convert it to the dual representation, um, we, we had something that wasn't quite that, that um, wasn't in the same natural terminology that we would use. Um, oh, and actually that's where I'm gonna stop. So uh, for part two, we'll talk about given everything we've just seen, given this long derivation, how do we actually run the simplex method? Given a particular basis, we now know what every part of our dictionary looks like in linear algebraic terms. How do we actually use that to get some work done?